Method to the Madness. My name is Rob Maxwell, and I am your host and podcast producer. The Method to the Madness is a podcast all about physical fitness and wellness. The purpose of my podcast is to go over what works in fitness and wellness, and most importantly, why it works. Hence the name, The Method to the Madness. Today's topic is my final principle in the seven principles of physical fitness and that principle is individuality so make sure you stay tuned and listen because this is a biggie i think people they need them all we need to know all of these but this one uh, i think it might uh hit home for you before i get into that i want to thank our sponsors jonathan and lynn gilden at the gilden group at realty pros let me tell you something podcast isn't free I love doing them. They're great. I think that we need to have a sensible voice out there in fitness, and I know that I am. There's a lot of disinformation out there, and uh, I like to get to the bottom of that. I always have in my career as a personal trainer, kind of cut to the chase and talk about the science behind fitness because, as I've always said, there is a method to the madness. So, our very first sponsor, our great sponsor, Jonathan and Lynn Gilden, have been awesome and uh, I really appreciate them and they really are the best agents around so if you're looking to buy or if you're looking to sell give them a shout they can be reached at the gildengroup.com or 386-451-2412 and I will put their information in the show notes because I know we don't always have a pencil and pen when we're listening to this podcast because most likely we are out there running and jogging and lifting weights and doing all those things now, I'm excited to announce that we are having a new sponsor begin with us this week, possibly two, one is for sure, and uh, I will give you all of their information, I believe, in the next podcast or so. I'm just waiting for it. So that's kind of cool. I'd like to see that we're growing. I want to remind everybody that if you ever have questions, email me, text me if you have my number. Go to the website and shoot me a question. Find me on social media. I'm very available. I like answering questions. I really, really do. So don't feel like it's a dumb question or a selfish question because as I used to tell my students that if you're thinking it, most likely other people are too. So if you don't feel like asking for yourself, ask the question for everybody else. All right. The final principle of the seven principles of physical fitness individuality and again as I said when I first introduced these in the beginning of the week it's not in an order of importance they are all absolutely important I'm not getting to individuality because it's the least important in doing it last no it's just kind of how it always flowed how I memorized them and used to teach them to my students it's really that simple so they're all equally important and uh I hope you go back and listen to all the podcasts on the seven principles because they will really help you understand what you need to be doing and how to structure your workout programs and possibly give insight to someone who might be structuring them for you if you don't feel like you are getting all of the benefits that you could benefit from. All right. So just a mini recap on the principles. So the principles are tried and proven. That's what a principle is. It's been tested. They work. Oftentimes we see trends and fads in physical fitness. I think we see them in all industry, right? I mean, every industry has trends and fads, okay? So to give you a little bit of education on what that means, a trend can be positive it can be negative so where are we trending in physical fitness the um, Ursha group that looks at all the different types of physical fitness anything from wellness centers to personal training boutiques to personal trainers to strength coaches to nutritionists to peloton to everything they always release at the end of the year the top 10 trends in fitness and I always like to look at that and see where things are trending 
As you might guess, a few years ago, Peloton was really trending to the top. It wasn't at the very top though. Boutique fitness with personal training was still like the top trend. I believe that the coronavirus <clears throat> definitely had an impact on that with people trying to get away from groups of people and getting in a more one-on-one uh, -on -one type of situation. But like the trends are always going in a certain direction in fitness. They tend to stay pretty consistent, but through the years we've seen some real odd ones kind of fizzle out. So the trend is can be positive or negative. Now, a fad is when the trend kind of catches fire, but we don't always trust the fads like we can potentially trust a trend, okay? So let's take Peloton, for example, and no, I'm not getting off the beaten path here with individuality. I mean, I might be a little bit, but that's okay because we're still learning something about physical fitness. So Peloton, as I said, was really trending and continued to in the last couple years or so. It started to go backwards a little bit but it's not a negative trend. I would say it did reach the fad status. Like, and then other things started coming out similar to Peloton with basically having online coaching um, as you go and workouts you can join and things like that. So that's still trending a little bit, although not as much as it was. But Peloton started to slide back a little bit. I think mostly just due to oversaturation of the market and uh, you know things that happen more on the business end versus on the fitness end of things but it's not a negative trend because it brought back spinning as a popular way to exercise and then a lot of people started getting into that like even the endurance athletes that use their own bikes on trainers set the trainers up on an online type of thing that can monitor their fitness and give them insight. So that's still trending in that direction. So that, you know, just because certain things like maybe the fad of Peloton financially is wearing off a little bit as far as how they're making money and they've even reduced bikes and things like that, it doesn't mean that the trend of indoor cycling or the trend of indoor monitoring is going down. And I don't really think it's going to. That's like a different world now. I mean, we're more online, we're more remote and things like that. So those are the differences between the two. The, the fads, you know, they're not always so great, right? We can all probably go back and think of a lot of different fads. In my latest book, You Can't Outrun a Poor Diet, I have a whole chapter on fad diets and I went through the years of different fads not only in dieting but in physical fitness and it was it was pretty uh, it was pretty funny you know um, I don't know if you guys remember the old thigh toner you know um, the thigh toner you know which is it wrong to work your adductor muscles by squeezing your legs in no it's not it's just the promise on TV was if you did so many reps per day or so much time per day, you would have thinner thighs, which of course is the myth of spot reduction and people just ate that up. You know, if you're one of them that bought one of them, uh, let me know. I'd be just curious, it'd be kind of funny. So anyway, those, you know, the fads aren't always great. So the fads like to really jump in and obviously I'm sure everybody's well aware that the fads goal, whoever, is creating the, the fad of the month, the fad of the year, is to make money. I mean, they, they see a need and they try to fix the need. And oftentimes they try to fix it to the greatest, the largest group of people out there because that's how they can make their most dollars. And they know for sure that nobody's gonna get one of these gizmos and reach their fitness goals. I mean, that's not really possible, but they don't care. And, Usually they make them cheap enough where people think, oh, what the hell, I'll do it. And then they make enough money and they get out of it and they never claim that they were authentic to begin with. So why do these things occur? They occur because everybody tends to think that there's just this wide open answer for everybody. And in the big picture, there is, but in the smaller picture, there isn't. And that's why the principle of individuality is so important. So in the big picture, sure, I mean, to lose weight, 
we have to eat less. I mean, that's just all there is to it. There's a lot of different ways to do it the most healthful way, and I cover that in my book, and I'm really not purposely trying to plug the book. It's just if you know me, I try to keep my rules very simple through the years. There are ways to do it, better ways, but at the end of the day, it's about eating less. There's just all there is to it, and I hate to break it to you because, look, I don't know anybody really that enjoys eating less. I mean, I think we all get used to the fact that when we start to eat less, we feel better. Like if we've been overeating and we don't do it anymore, we feel just as satiated from eating a moderate amount of food as we did when we binged. Yes, and we absolutely know that in the long run, it's better for us, which makes us feel better too. But at the time, when you're enjoying whatever it is you're enjoying, and let's say you're having one of those um, you know, super great frappuccinos that just taste so damn good, and they do because they're loaded with sugar and cream and fats and things like that, and we get to the end, and if somebody said, hey, you know, let me pour my quarter of the cup in the bottom of your cup, you can finish this off, you're gonna wanna do it. Why? It tastes good. So when we get to that last sip, there's always that point of, eh, that's a little disappointing. I wish there was more, right? So nobody really wants to eat less. Nobody, nobody. It's just the people who get successful at maintaining their body weight do a better job of delaying the gratification and knowing what's best for them and taming those tigers at the time. That's all there is to it. Everybody wants to eat a little bit more when something tastes good. I mean, that is a guarantee. The only time that may not be true, I experienced it when I had COVID and had zero appetite, is in those types of situations. Like when you're sick and the thought of food makes you sick and you have like zero motivation. And man, let me tell you, that little side story, that was like frustrating. That was unbelievable because um, I, you know, I maintain a healthy body weight and uh, you know, I certainly don't need to lose weight. And I eat a lot of food, I eat a lot of good food, I eat throughout the day, but I eat healthy foods. So during COVID, like I had no appetite and I was trying to eat crap that I would normally just never eat. Still got a little congestion. And um, <clears throat> I couldn't do it. It was so frustrating to me. I couldn't do it. Like It's like, man, I really want to just eat this entire pizza. And I'd have one bite and I just couldn't. I had no appetite. I'm like, this isn't fair. You know, so obviously, uh, you know, that goes away, thankfully, and I got my appetite back. But we all want to eat more. That's just a fact. So that's, and we know that if we overeat, we're going to gain weight. So that's a universal rule. And the other universal rule is we all need to move and get exercise to be the best we can be, right? But then within that, we're all individualities. And if we try to follow somebody else's way, again, general tips are great, but if we try to follow somebody else's way thinking it's gonna work, we don't understand that everybody is different with their own needs, all right? So there's genetics involved. Big time genetics has a factor, is a factor in how we respond. I'm gonna briefly tell you the famous or infamous Kenny story that I've told clients for many, many years. When I was, I tell it in my book, I believe, when I was a young whippersnapper working out in my 20s at our little muscle head gym in New Smyrna Beach, um, you know, I thought I was the bomb diggity and, uh, you know, we, I was in college, early, early part of college when I was down there. And, um, into bodybuilding, hadn't competed in a competition yet, but was pretty ready, but uh, was a little too nervous to get up on the stage and always found a way to back out. But 
the point is that I was physically ready for it. I was muscular, I was lean, I was strong. And so I kind of hung out with some of the big boys in the gym, you know. And uh, I had a friend named Kenny, and we went to college together, and he was more of a basketball player type of guy. He was about 6'2". I think he was 160 pounds, maybe, maybe a little bit less than that. Very thin, what we now know of as an ectomorph, which I wouldn't have, couldn't have told you that then. That's his body type. But at the time, like all of us 20-something-year-olds, he was obsessed with having a better body and trying to get girls, because that, he thought, was the key. And um, maybe everybody thought that, who knows, but he did. And uh, he was my buddy, good guy, worked out, you know, uh, hung out a lot. So, you know, we became friends and, and he looked up to me into the gym. You know, he was always like, man, I want to be big like you, strong like you. So I brought him into the rest of my posse of the big boys and, uh, you know, we wanted to introduce him to heavy lifting and, and all that kind of stuff. And uh, he didn't know better. I mean, it's like, look. It's as simple as, dude, work harder, you'll get bigger. I mean, that's what I thought. That's what we all thought. So this poor guy, man, you talk about a guy that could take a beating. I mean, tall and thin, and he could outwork almost anybody. And we would just load him up with weight today that I would cringe in my gym if I saw the type of form that we had this guy do, really thinking we were helping him. We all liked the guy. And, uh, you know, we'd wrap his knees with the knee wraps and we're doing these heavy squats, way heavier than he should have had on his spine. And pushing them and, you know, spotting them and doing forced reps and we would do the same with upper body and everything that we did. And, you know, after a few months, six months, whatever, I mean, the poor guy never grew. I mean, it was just Kenny was Kenny. Did he get a little bit stronger? I think so. I know he never changed his body type. Was he not working hard enough? Come on, man, put a little more effort into it. No, of course he was. It just wasn't his body type. And maybe we had an inkling of information then and we're just like, well, it's gonna take you longer, who knows, nobody, everybody was positive and supportive, but the poor guy never grew. I mean, like I said, he would just take a beating and keep coming back. So that was my first real life story into the principle of individuality. So what we now know, and I use this term a lot with a lot of my clients, especially that you know are, are men that want to add muscle and maybe have an ectomorphic frame, there's genetics. So first off, we have different body types. There's an ectomorph, a mesomorph, and an endomorph. The ectomorph are born tall and thin and have like very thin ankles, very thin wrists. Um, I shouldn't say they're born, they're born tall. They're thin though and sometimes they can be tall. Definitely thin boned, always tend to be on the skinny side. Your mesomorph is your muscular build. They're like your linebacker in football, your wide receiver, your bodybuilder, and a lot of times now your NBA basketball players like LeBron James is a classic mesomorph, just very muscular. Michael Jordan was a mesomorph, a little bit smaller than LeBron, but he was in, or is a mesomorph. I shouldn't say was, we keep the same body type. And endomorph tend to always have more body fat than the rest. They tend to store more subcutaneous fat, they have thicker bones, and they don't have a tendency to get lean. So right there with the three muscle groups, you have individuals, different individuals that have a different muscular component and a different fat component. So mesomorphs, the muscular ones, can get very lean, but they also can gain some body fat. The ectomorphs have trouble getting any body fat ever, and the endomorphs tend to store more body fat. So there's your body types. Those are called your body types or your somatotypes, somatotypes. Then you have hormone levels. Everybody's born with different levels of hormones, testosterone, human growth hormone, estrogen. That is different within everybody. Sometimes you will see the guy in high school or, or even better, in, in my case, we had junior high school, um, eighth and ninth, which I guess is you know almost high school and then almost middle school, but we had junior high school. And I remember we had guys with like full beards. <laughs> And, uh, you know, they already had like these receding hairlines in, in, as a senior in high school. And it's like, you know, why, why, you know, why? Well, it's very simple. They had more testosterone. 
they had more they were born with more higher levels of testosterone and they started maturing so much faster you know the the downside to that is if if they're into vanity and stuff well you may end up losing your hair sooner and things like that but definitely more testosterone which does help with fat loss and does help with muscle gain so then there are fast twitch and slow twitch muscle fibers we don't all have an equal amount everybody is born different so some people have more fast twitch muscle fiber they're the more muscular people they're the sprinters they're faster they're probably better at team sports like basketball and football and baseball then you have the people that are born with more slow twitch muscle fibers and they're better at like cross-country running and cross-country skiing and they can bicycle across the country and things like that and then you have some people that are born with an even mixture of the two but see that sounds great on one hand but it's not if they ever want to be an elite athlete because an elite athlete has to be 90 percent above one and 10 percent the other whichever direction so in other words an elite marathon runner or an elite 5k runner i often laugh when people call the 5k a sprint because it's 3.1 miles it's like uh that's still very aerobic ladies and gentlemen we're in our aerobic system from three minutes on so that's still very aerobic so your elite 5k runner is going to be 90 percent slow twitch muscle fiber just like the marathoner your elite linebacker wide receiver or shooting guard in the nba is going to be 90 percent fast twitch muscle fiber your elite bodybuilder is going to be 90 percent so it's great to kind of be 50 50 if you want to be really good jack of all trades but it's not great if you want to be elite at something and then where you fall kind of like is is depends on where your fiber types are so if you find you're more you're better at one area it's like well you probably have more of that muscle fiber type and muscle fibers by the way outside of the type 2a muscle fibers which are your intermediate muscle fibers the major type 1 fibers and major type 2 fibers cannot be altered so you are what you are okay so these are some of the areas of individuality now let me tackle one more and then I'll talk to you about what you can do about it the vo2 max is the measurement of your cardiorespiratory system believe it or not that's not very trainable either they found that there's only a 10 to 15 percent gain that can be had from your vo2 max and that a lot of it's genetic that doesn't mean you can't improve your endurance because what they found was that training your lactate threshold or anaerobic threshold in other words getting used to higher levels of lactate getting your body to be able to tolerate it will improve your endurance but as far as having a an elite vo2 max like we hear about with the lance armstrongs of the world and the miguel enderons and all these great marathoners and other sports it's not in the cards if it's not in the cards so that is also very individual as far as your vo2 max and finally as is flexibility i talked to a client about that yesterday they said well i've always been able to stretch this correct and then there are people that are in the opposite camp where they stretch 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 and they just have very tight shortened muscles and they can improve it a little bit but they'll never be accused of being a gymnast so individuality takes all of this into account so that's like the method to the madness those are the things which determine what type of program you're going to be on now what you have to do is you have to number one you have to accept that please hear me there's nothing negative in this message everybody can get stronger everybody can improve their muscle mass everybody can improve their cardiorespiratory endurance everybody can slightly alter their range of motion everybody can get better at sports 
you have to accept just how much better you can get. And there's nothing wrong with that. If you're always comparing yourself to yourself, what's the problem? If you want to get big and strong like some guy you see on Instagram, you're probably never gonna hit your goal. If you want to say at the beginning of the year, I could bench press, I don't know, 100 pounds, and at the end of the year, I can do 150 pounds, so I have increased my bench press by 50%. That's pretty damn good, right? Almost 100% increase. I think if that was in the stock market, we'd be pretty damn happy with those returns. So we have to just accept that we can all get better. And what we need to be striving for is optimal fitness, health, and wellness. Because let's take the Kennys of the world who just won't accept their individuality and they get on a program like a top tier bodybuilder. Thankfully, Kenny was this pretty smart kid and uh, I'm sure grew away from that and just did health and fitness for the sake of improving himself. Lost touch with him, but I'm pretty sure that knowing him, that's probably what happened. And by the way, he already was super fit. He just wanted to be bigger. But let's say you're like him, but you have an unhealthy perspective. So you continue to just mash yourself at the gym doing what big Brutus Beefcake's doing all the time. And where is that going to get you? It's probably going to get you hurt. It's going to get overuse injuries. It could even get into acute injuries. And you're just going to waste a lot of time. You're probably going to drop out and quit. Now let's take somebody else who maybe tends to be on the slightly larger size of fitness. And by the way, there is nothing wrong with that. I had a friend who um, sadly passed away in his own aircraft. He was a pilot and um, he, we went to school together and he got his master's degree in uh, exercise physiology like I did. And, uh, you know, uh, Jamie Fletcher is his name. And, you know, you're out there listening to my brother. You're, you're an awesome man. You, you were always a role model with me. And uh, we did some relays together. You know, he tended to have a little bit larger build. And I knew few people that could outrun and work Fletch. In other words, for his size, man, he was an athlete. The dude played football. He was a SEAL. He was incredible. And uh, he just had a larger build. You know, he was probably somewhere between a meso endo because none of us are well i shouldn't say none of us the elites are definitely all one area but he was probably a uh meso endo which meant he was muscular but also tended towards the larger size and man he could run for his size he could outbike most people because in cycling it's not as about being weight bearing he just accepted the fact that he probably wasn't going to have rip shredded washboard abs and you know he could care less but like that was the healthy perspective that I wish people have. Just improve who you are. And that's how he was. So you can be a bigger athlete and still be killing it and crushing it. Just because you don't have washboard abs doesn't mean you're not a killer athlete. So that's like the, the message that I wish people would get. So if you're a bigger athlete and you want to say, have your best 5K ever, absolutely, man, go for it. Like. But the reason why you're not beating the, the, the guys at the very, very front or the gals at the very, very front probably you know, doesn't have anything to do with your training. You don't have to do more miles. You don't have to work harder at track or any of those things. Look at their body types, man. You probably outweigh them by 70 pounds. I mean, if you don't think that matters, go pick up two 35-pound dumbbells and run a 5K. I mean, so... You know, we have to understand that we can't be following the pack. We're individuals. There are general fitness principles like these seven I've talked about. Absolutely. But we can't follow the pack. We have to figure out what is absolutely best for us. I mean, that's what we do at the gym. When somebody comes in, first they call or they text or they hit me up on Messenger and you know, nowadays, I hate to say it, most people we have to turn down because we have a waiting list, but we, you know, we let them know that. But in the days when we we're taking people, it was like, well, you know, we feel them out with a couple questions first, and then we'll do an, a telephone consult to 
Uh, I really like to screen my clients, and then you know if we f- feel like it could be a match, they come in and and I figure out where they are, and then I tell them like where I think what they need to do to reach their goals, and if they kind of like you know hedge from that a little bit and start going, well, my old trainer had me do this and it really worked, and blah blah blah, I could tell that they might be a little obsessive and they're they're just not going to get there because they believe that if they just do the work of their next door neighbor, they're gonna look like their next door neighbor. And I just have a hard time getting people to understand that the principle of individuality says, no, you're not gonna look like your neighbor. And maybe you're looking outside going, thank God, I don't know. (laughs) But the point is, you're gonna look like you. And you should be pretty damn good in in your mind. So if you're gonna look like you, you need to get on a program that helps you look more like you but the absolute best version of you. Don't you agree? I think you do. I hope you nodded your head. All right. So that wraps up our principles, and uh, it's been fun going over them. And until next time, be max fit and be max well.